Hi, I'm Chris Fleming, the creator of Spirit Talk. You're listening to the podcast where I'll be bringing you the greatest thinkers, researchers, and contributors from around the world to discuss what we know in the field of the paranormal, life after death, and the pursuit of higher consciousness. One of the worst things that you can do to the universe is try and craft it into a narrative. Uh, try to find an answer to it. But when you challenge the universe like that, when you try to confine it, that's when you will lose your mind. You'll go crazy rolling around uh, looking for answers when the reality is it's not about answers. It's about knowing that this stuff happens, being satisfied with the fact that it happens, and being self-assured that your experience is real whether or not anyone believes it. It's Chris Fleming. Welcome back to this month's edition of Spirit Talk. I want to tell you, this guy that I've got on right now, we're going to be speaking with, he's got an incredible background, but the interests span over decades. His name is John E.L. Tenney, and he's been actively involved in the field of anomalistic and conspiratorial occult and paranormal research for three decades. And over the past 29 years, more than 80,000 people have attended one of John's signature weird lectures. While why some people might consider some of the stuff he talks about as weird, I think it's completely intriguing and interesting. He has columns and articles that have been printed in magazines and newspapers worldwide. And he's lectured to around the world to public and private schools, universities, organizations, and clubs. Now, he's the author of over a dozen books. And Mr. Tenney has been interviewed extensively on radio and television shows worldwide. He's created podcasts such as Real Lost, Realm of the Weird, and due to extended time involved in anomalistic research, he has acted as a consultant for companies including NBC, A&E, Fox, Sci-Fi, Discovery Channel, The New York Times, Reader's Digest, and Wall Street Journal. And over the last 27 years, he's worked and appeared on numerous television shows, including the famous Unsolved Mysteries, Sightings, Very Scary Stories, and you may remember him from Paranormal State. The New Class, and of course, Ghost Stalkers and Paranormal Lockdown. Well, let's get talking with this interesting guy. John, welcome to the show. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. You know, I'm trying to sit here today before we uh, start recording this podcast. I'm like, when did I first meet John? I don't know if it was at Scarefest or where was it? Do you remember? I really don't have any idea. It's lost to the history of time. It <laughs> might have been Scarefest or it might have even been, because I was trying to deep dive that too. Um, for some reason, I feel like it was a smaller convention where I first met you, where it was just, it almost seems like a local metaphysical convention, either in Chicago or the surrounding area. Yeah, because you were very familiar to me. And I remember we've had a couple conversations here and there. And then I know you had the in search of t-shirts and I said, oh my God, you know, we start getting into discussing some of the shows from the seventies, but your name just pops up everywhere. And I have to ask, you know, what events in your life, because everybody has a different background story, okay? What events in your life got you interested in phenomena like this? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of people in this uh, community that have stories about being little kids and seeing ghosts or having a UFO experience at a young age or something like that. And mine is not typical in the sense that I was just a punk rock kid in the eighties and I hated people telling me how to think and what to think about. And I used to skip school all the time and I was bad at skipping school. So <laughs> when, I, when I skipped, I would go to the library to show you how bad I was at doing that. And I would sit in the library and just read books that weren't shown to me in school. So that was books about strangeness and psychology at the time you know, I was in high school and they weren't letting us read a lot of deep philosophy and there was an old, older gentleman there who would talk to me about art and jazz and life and death. And he really kind of started me thinking outside of the box. And strangely enough, he ended, that ended up being Jack Kevorkian. Oh, my God. So he, he lived in my hometown. And at the time, he was just Dr. Jack. And, you know, uh, the scandals around him hadn't started yet. But he was the one who 
actually kind of pushed me in a lot of, you know, if you're reading this, you should be reading that. If you're reading magic, maybe you should read this fiction. If you're reading this fiction, maybe you should read this uh, paranormal researcher. So he was your first mentor. <laughs> uh, to a certain degree, yeah. And then uh, when I was 16, I met a teacher of history at Wayne State University who specialized in conspiracy theories, political assassinations of the 60s and 70s. And he took me under his wing and taught me how to write FOIA requests and how to deal with government institutions and how to do research. And by 1990, uh, I was doing lectures. And so that's when I say 29 years, I, I always count my first paid lecture as when I began, even though I had wow. history before that. Wow, that's incredible. You know, you just brought up uh, talking about some of the governmental stuff, political stuff. Obviously, you've looked at the, some of the conspiracies regarding JFK. You know, off the top of your head, what, what do you think happened with JFK when he was shot in Dallas? So one of the things that we used to focus on a lot, uh, Craig and I, my mentor, was people would always ask us when we would do lectures, who shot Kennedy? And our big response to that was always the fact that everybody is so obsessed with finding out who shot Kennedy, they're missing the grander picture, which is why was Kennedy shot or why would he be shot? Why would someone want to kill him? And the answer is really the fact that if there was a reason, a good reason for killing Kennedy, it was the fact that he was shaking up uh, long-standing and kind of antiquated modes of thought. So when he was running for re-election, he said, "If if I'm elected, I'll smash the CIA and scatter their and scatter them to the to the wind like dust." Um, he signed a memorandum in 1963, about a month before he was shot, which reversed all of the orders about Vietnam and brought all of the American troops home by Christmas of 1964. And so he was ending the Vietnam War in 1964. Wow. Uh, the day after, or, you know, there's a very famous photo of Lyndon Johnson being sworn in as the president on the plane. Uh, and Jackie's standing next to him, you know, hours after John is dead. And the first thing that Lyndon Johnson did as president was signed a memorandum which reversed Kennedy's and sent troops to Vietnam and escalated the war into the 70s. Oh, my God. So, wow. So I don't know who shot him, but mm -hmm. uh, the motivations behind it were a, a sea change for politics and corporate greed and the military industrial complex. And so he had to go. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, I know there's been conspiracies here and there that, you know, he was going to release about the New World Order. He was going to talk about UFOs, the existence of aliens, uh, all this other stuff. And who knows, maybe bits and pieces of those had something to do with it. But when you look at the military industrial complex and the politicians, like you stated, the greed that goes involved. That's a, that's a wow. prime, prime motivator. Yeah, it is. And, if, you know, we could, we could go on a whole podcast and talk about 9-11. We could talk about Bush and Cheney and, you know, the Middle East and all that. It's not what we're here for. But it's interesting how, at a young age, you were learning a lot about the conspiracies and the scenarios that go on behind it. I mean, that's fascinating. I, I think for myself, I think that that's really the biggest jumping off point, not so much learning about the conspiracy theories, but learning that in life, you don't really get definitive answers that you're making good guesses based with the information you have. You're doing the best with the best tools that you have. And that sometimes if you have a belief structure, it can act not so much as a cornerstone, but it can act as concrete shoes. And so you have to be willing to be flexible about your ideas. And that really helped when I moved into the realm of paranormal and supernatural. That's thought. interesting you state that because uh, I want to share something with you in a little bit when we get to another question that uh, we do. We get kind of pigeonholed into this way of thinking. And when we have an experience, we try to fit that into the little cubby hole to make it fit and make sense. But then sometimes later in life, we realize it was something else or it was something even bigger. You know, yeah, we didn't absolutely. have that awareness at that time. And uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. You were obviously researching a lot of these books and you were finding out things that were fascinating. You were being talked about in school. And then you had a couple mentors here that were kind of directing you into ways of thought of expanding yourself to look at things in a different way, as well as other possibilities. So what was your favorite topic, or maybe it's probably better to ask that now, is with all these years that you've been doing this, what is your favorite topic now? Is it ghosts, UFOs, anomalies, creatures? What would you say you really <laughs> like to dig your claws into? 
I think what's interesting is over the years, I've gone through these kind of cyclical uh, loves. So uh, re- UFO is really hard for a few years and, and, you know, monsters for a few years. But as I get older and older, I just become fascinated with our perception of what seems to be a shared reality, our existence within it, um, how we are even conscious of knowing that we're inside of some type of reality. And I think that when we break the universe and the cosmos and, it, and its happenings, when we break it down into its component parts of calling it ghosts or phantoms and monsters and UFOs and aliens, I think that when you do that, you kind of lessen the beauty of the creativity of the cosmos. You miss the, you study so much time studying the tentacles, you miss the octopus. And so I think at this point in my life, uh, I'm very fascinated with the octopus. Oh my God, we're on the same wham link. Same wavelength. Um, that octopus being the gateway of everything that exists here and just outside our realm. Okay, that's that's another question we're leading up to. <laughs> I want the listeners to realize that this is becoming even more impressive. I know we've had conversations in the past and our fascination with some of the groundwork that's been started years ago with paranormal TV you know, regarding investigative shows and documentaries. And, you know, I'm looking at your bio and everything and stuff that you're fascinated with, and I see so many similarities. I mean, you've got In Search Of, Project UFO. You know, I was also interested in Outer Limits, Twilight Zone, and that that breaking that consciousness, even though that part was actually fiction and fantasy, was that realization and questioning of what exists outside our planet and the universe, as well as interdimensionally. But then also... Kolchak the Night Stalker was my favorite TV show in the early 70s. And yes, it kept me up at night because, you know, I was, geez, what was I, like three, four, five years old, six years old. So it was terrifying. But when you have that fantasy show that you're watching and then you start having paranormal things going on around you, it's kind of bizarre because you you begin to wonder, well, there's got to be people out there that's investigating it. When you were younger, you started watching these shows. I mean, what was like the earliest paranormal experience you've ever had that you can remember? Um, Yeah, I mean, I love Twilight Zone, too. I actually collect uh, actors from the Twilight Zone's autographs. Twilight Zone was a big influence on me. Just uh, I I loved Serling's narration and the fact that there was all this weird stuff going on. But then a guy would just walk into, into frame and somehow exist in that universe but not exist in that universe, even though the show was fictionalized, it, it brought it was this weird uh, psychological break for me where I'm watching a fictional show, but there's a real guy using his real name talking to me. So breaking the fourth wall and he's standing inside of a studio, which is fake filming a fake thing. There was just a whole level that I loved it. But uh, my first, you know, the very first thing that I tell people this all the time. Uh, like I said, I, I figure that I started really becoming interested in this stuff around 14, 15 years old. Uh, and I do have experiences that are pre that when I was younger. Uh, but because of what I know about the brain and my mind, I doubt even the experiences itself. And and the first time that I really ever thought about did something weird happen, my great grandmother had died. I didn't have I grew up without any grandparents. And my great grandmother had died and I went to her funeral. I was about seven and I had never been to a funeral before. And I think that the adults didn't want to shock me or scare me. So they allowed me to sit out in the kind of waiting room uh, to not go into the open coffin funeral. And I don't I remember not understanding why I wasn't allowed to look in there. And one of the adults, my uncle said, oh, you know, your, your great grandma's in there. We're just going and saying goodbye to her. And I kind of sneaked a look around the corner and there were all these people and they were crying and weeping. And there was this big box, which I didn't really know was a coffin at the times in the front. But my great grandmother was standing next to it and she kind of winked at me and gave me a little grandmotherly wave and smiled. And then I leaned back and I was like, oh, yeah, I guess grandma's in there. So about a day later, I was talking to my mom. I said, why wasn't that, Why couldn't I go say goodbye to grandma? And they said, oh, you know, well, we just didn't know if you were prepared for it. And I said, well, she waved at me and winked at me. So at least, you know, she knew I was there. <laughs> and they were like, oh, no, that couldn't have happened. That couldn't have happened. And, and I think, it, you know, I reflect back on it now and I'm like, 
that I, it probably did happen. But again, like I'm a child, it's a traumatic, stressful situation. I don't know what my imagination could have conjured up, but I like to think that she winked at me and waved goodbye. Oh, that is so cool. You know, a lot of consulting I do with, with families and with kids and stuff when they talk about what's happened to them when they were younger, where their father or parent died when they were really young or a grandparent, and they came and visited them at that time just to let them know, hey, I'm okay. Because they knew as that child gets older, letting them know that they're okay is going to help them in the uh, grieving process or the understanding process that there is, there is a life after death. You know, you know that's interesting because... Uh, I recently was at an event in Virginia, and after my lecture, a gentleman came up to me and uh, very emotional, asked if you could speak with me alone outside, and I said, sure. And he came up to me, he was about 35 or 36, and he said, listen, uh, my mother passed away about a week ago, and I really miss her, and she hasn't come to visit me, and I really want her to come and visit me, and I'm, I'm wondering if you can tell me why she hasn't. And of course, I can't. Um, but I'm there to console people and listen to their stories and try and help them work through the experiences. And I asked him about his life and he said, you know, it's just me and her and we grew up and she always took care of me. Everything I ever needed, she was there. Um, she gave me everything that she could give me and she always looked out for me. She maybe looked out for me a little too much, but she was, uh, always there. And I, I always, you know, accepted willingly everything that she gave me and, and now she won't come to me. And there was this kind of spark in my head and I looked at him and I said, maybe she's not coming to you because she still knows what you need and she knows that you need to move on without her. She's taken care of you your whole mm -hmm. life, maybe a little too much. You even said that. And maybe she wants you to be able to stand on your own. That's really powerful. How did he take it? Uh, he laughed and he said, that would be like her. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. See, that's the, the wonderful thing about having experiences is to where you can relate, even though you don't have the direct answer at times, is you can relate what you do know in a way to people that need an answer. They need something. And you can share with them whatever knowledge you have in bringing them some form of understanding or comfort. That's great. Yeah, it's, uh, it's it's last week I lost two friends in a matter of like two days, um, both very young, 37 and 46. And it's always odd when I go to a funeral now because people expect me to have yeah. an answer or uh, to be able to give them some deeper uh, philosophical idea of what's going on. And of course, I'm I have my experiences and my thoughts and ideas, but I, I don't know any answers. But one of the things that I have found for myself over the years, whether it's losing friends or family, is realizing that the things that I love about people, uh, their kindness, their caring, their tenderness, their love, those things which make them who they are, were never tangible in the first place. Uh, the loss of their biological form and not being able to touch it and see it. That's greed on my behalf. I want more of them, which is biological. Mm -hmm. But the things that I loved about them, which are infinite and eternal, things that I couldn't touch in the first place, they're still here in that way as much as they ever right. were. We don't always realize that at times. And I know my stepdad said to me years ago when my, uh, when my mother's mom had died, and we were there, and we were in the car, and he says, you know, as human beings, sometimes we're really selfish. And I said, what do you mean? He says, well, when we lose somebody, we want them here with us. We don't want them to go. We don't want them to leave us. But yet, they're going home, and they've lived their life, and maybe they don't want to be here anymore, and they've done everything they can. So why can't we just let them go home? Right. Exactly. I think that it's interesting, too, that you said that, because one of the things I mentioned in my lectures is that cross-culturally cross and, and around the world, uh, beyond religions and beyond spiritual belief systems, people talk about death as a homecoming, people going home. Uh, and when you deep dive just that quick sentence that you're going home, it means you're going back to the place that you came right. from. You're going back to the place that's the most comfortable for you. Uh, the, the time that we have in these biological forms is very short uh, in regards to our infinite selves, which lie on either side. Right. Yeah, it's, 
it's a celebration when we go home. You know, it's, you talk about friends and, you know, I've stated this publicly. I've had four people that have been a part of my life that have died this year. And uh, one of them, you know, we won a championship football. Uh, we had a successful team for three years. Uh, he was a police officer. He died in a motorcycle accident. And I got the call from one of the officers when I was in the UK filming, telling me to call me now. It's, it's an emergency. And, you know, when I got back to the hotel, I called him and, uh, you know, he was devastated. And I said, oh, my God. And then uh, there was uh, a friend of mine that was uh, he's a fraternity brother. Uh, I went to Bloyd College, Wisconsin. We were Sigma Chi's, and we used to go out all the time, you know, when we were in college. And I remember many times he'd come down to my room and says, hey, we're all going out. I said, I can't. I got to do homework. Or I'm reorganizing my audio cassettes (laughs) or something. I always was such an organized person (laughs) that I was always busy doing these things that are just completely meaningless. But yet to me, having everything organized and and copied and and, and, and in a situation was, to me, needed to be done. And, And I hate myself for that because... There was, I missed out on some wonderful moments of just friendships. But I remember he used to say, man, you're always too busy. You're always so busy. Dude, you're, I'm so busy. You know, that was the big joke around the house. I'm so busy. But when I got word uh, a couple years ago when he had cancer, I could not go because I was filming and I was really upset about that. And then I got word that uh, it came back and he was having a birthday party. So I drove about two hours to go see him for his birthday. He was going through chemo. And when I sat there talking to him, I said, he's not going to last long. And then when I got word he's deteriorated, hadn't been eating, lost 60 pounds, all the fraternity guys said, hey, we're all coming in from different cities. Uh, We're going to get together and we're going to go see him because this might be the last time we see him. I said, I'm there. I'm canceling my whole week. I'm going. So it was, I want to say for everybody listening, how powerful this was. Because we all have to face mortality And when I showed up there, there's guys that I have not seen since I graduated in 1989. These are guys that I fought hard with on a football field. I played college football. They blocked for me. I sometimes blocked for them. I scored a touchdown. We celebrated. We won and we lost together. And now we've all aged. We're all different. We have different lives. But the commonality was we all came from the same fraternity, which our fraternity was in a hoax signal win case. We're in the sign we will conquer. And there was big brotherhood and, and religious, spiritual uh, meanings to our fraternity, which is great because I see it served me well. But being there, realizing we're dealing with mortality, I could see on everybody's face this, they don't know how to act. They don't know what to say because it's a taboo to talk about someone dying and this and that. We had our lunch. We go to go visit our friend. Everybody gets their turn to go in there. And when I went in there, I asked everybody to leave, and I just wanted to be with them on my own. And I said to him, I said, uh, I said, Jeff, remember all the time you came down and you says, and I told you I was too busy? He goes, yeah. I said, well, I'm still busy, but I'm not busy enough where I can't come here and pay my respects to you. And I said, I want to thank you for being my friend. I want to thank you for the time that we shared in college and even some of those times we saw each other spoke after it. I want to thank you for the wonderful family you have and and the friendships you've kept going and how you've been a light in a dark world. And I said, I know you have fears and questions about death and what your family is going to be like when you're gone. I said, I'm here to answer those for you. So I told him all these things that I know from my experiences. And he had this big smile on his face. And I said, I'll see you again. And I started crying. And he looked at me and I said, I'm not crying because you're going to be leaving us, Jeff. I'm crying because you're going home and I can't wait to go home, (laughs) you know? And I said, that's where we all go. I said, so I'll see you again on the bridge, brother, you know? And then that was it. And then I remember sitting around with all the guys. They said, you know, it's amazing. We're all here. We got our guy. And I'm sitting there going, you got your guy. And they all looked at me and says, we now know what questions to ask. We can go to you about death and about the afterlife. And I sat there going, holy cow, this is something I can give back to them with all the wonderful yeah. times and the times they've been there for me. And it's like, I accept that honor and whatever you guys need, I'm here whenever you need me. And that was, yeah. that was John, for me, that was such a powerful thing because I know a lot about this. I've had out-of-body experiences. I've had near-death experiences. I communicate with spirits. So if I have an answer to the question, I'm there for them. And even if I don't, like you stated, like you said to that gentleman, you know, you gave him some advice based on your knowledge. And that was all he needed to probably get him to pick himself up and start living 
his life. And I think that's the biggest thing for us in the paranormal is to be there for those people to share what we know. Yeah. I, I, I've told people uh, for a while now at my lectures, um, um, if you can imagine a world where there are no ghosts, uh, where all that, the, all that ghosts and spirits and angels and all they are, are stories. Mm -hmm. If that's all they are, uh, if all they are, are the mechanism for human beings to talk to each other about the deep thoughts that they have about the existence that they currently are having. That's still massively important because it's a, it's a means for us to communicate our ideas and to relate with each other and to find our commonalities and to overlook our differences and realize that we all have questions. We all have our various answers, but if all ghosts are our stories, it's still very important because it allows us to interact with our, our family all over the world. That's a wonderful way to put it. You've done a lot of things in your life with speaking and a lot of the books that you've written. Obviously, your future has been paved by some of the things that you have read and studied and experienced as a kid. When you take a look at you know, TV today, there's a lot of ghost hunting shows, there's a lot of paranormal shows out there, and you rewind and you go back to the early stages, like we were talking earlier with such shows as In Search Of, Outer Limits, Project UFO. What were the one shows that still stick out in your mind today that have their originality, have their flavor, and really importance in the way you look at the world with paranormal type TV? Uh, in Search Of is always massively important to me just because it was the first time that I realized, you know, people think of In Search Of and they think of ghosts and Bigfoot and UFOs, but they don't realize that it was mysteries. It was these questions that we have about everything. There were episodes about Amelia Earhart or D.B. Cooper. Uh, some of them were just about treasure. And, and I know, I remember as a kid uh, coming home one time from school and there was an episode of uh, In Search Of that was on and they were, they were doing the uh, episode, which is like the secret life of plants. Uh, if plants can communicate, if they have a consciousness, if, how do they exist? And, and I remember that kind of burning into my brain at a younger age thinking to myself like, Oh, everything is, everything is alive. Like even the things I don't recognize as being alive, they all have some type of existence. And that was really formative. And I look at myself now, um, you know, for years I was vegetarian and now I'm vegan. And I, I have this overwhelming love of everything that's alive and things that don't seem to be alive. Uh, but that really shaped me. I think that was the first time that I started to consider, oh, uh, maybe uh, animals have uh, a spirit life as much as humans do. Maybe plants do. Maybe the earth does. Maybe the cosmos does. So that was really, uh, it really changed how I thought about the universe. That's incredible. Um, I've been having conversations over the last couple of years about plants and how they are communicating and science has come out with the clicks and various forms of communication. And there's the, obviously the, the fungi that's under the ground that has these like neurotransmitters and, and signals that they send all underground in communicating and finding it fascinating because they have a communication system that we're just beginning to understand. That goes along with your saying that, you know, everything is alive. A friend of mine who's a botanist, uh, his minor is in botany and his uh, PhD is in neurobiology, and he's very fascinated with the consciousness and the intelligence of plants. And when I became vegan, I called him up and I said, listen, I'm only eating plants at this point, so you have to, <laughs> you have to, make, you have to tell me something that makes me okay with eating plants. And he laughed as well when I said that to him. And he, he reassured me by telling me something which I had never thought about before. He said, listen, he said, plants are non-locomotive. They do not move. Uh, if they do, it's very subtly swaying in the wind. So there are some like banana trees will have a tendency to walk a few feet just because of their root system. He said, but they are non-locomotive. And over the millennia, uh, the evolution of the earth, they took their seeds and they hid them within savory treats for the animals that could walk. 
Uh, you are doing exactly what the plants want you to do. You are under their control. You eat them and you move their seeds around. And that is exactly what they've always wanted us to do. The plants are in control. Well, obviously, he's never seen the movie Day of the Triffids. <laughs> <laughs> But it's interesting. He even points out something that which I had never realized before, which was he was talking about plants being yeah. precognizant and having uh, being able to predict the future. And when I questioned him about that, he pointed out the fact that long before there was animal life on the planet, uh, plants had grown these multicolored flowers and they had become uh, filled with pollen. And they did that without having bees to wow. pollinate them. They did it before the insects came around. And so it was almost as if plants knew something was coming that would move them. That's incredible. There's no reason to have a, a, a beautiful smelling rose if there's nothing there to smell it. And yet the, the plants knew to do stuff like that. I got in a car accident in 2009, suffered a, uh, some damage to my left cerebral vorta part of my brain and uh, sometimes i forget the terms and i suffered whiplash and some damage between the c1 to the c7 i was okay for a while and then it started getting worse and there was a period of time like between uh, 2011 to like 2015 that were just brutal so to compensate for that i know that we are more than our physical body i started really diving into higher consciousness and saying i'm more than my physical body i'm going to overcome this and i started doing a lot of more non-local meditation where I started going on, then researching whatever I could find, and I found some interesting things, and one of them was the gateway, the gateway analysis that uh, Army Intelligence had done in 1983 regarding Robert Monroe and the Monroe Institute, and then uh, their summary mm -hmm. in that report regarding consciousness, the absolute, using the word absolute, which is this infinite intelligence that Napoleon Hill talked about, Einstein, and even Tesla talked about, that is collective of consciousness, but they illustrate it in such a way in this document that's on the CIA website that they talk about in uh, non-descriptive terms, but in their more scientific military terms, that the absolute is basically the God, the creator, and the our soul and our spirits are basically being created, sent here to have a collaborated experience with this absolute, and then brought back, but we maintain our independence but our entire experience has been now uploaded to the absolute. And they explain this uh, from going through the program and experiencing it themselves. And then they explain it through known physics and physicists at the time who support it. And then they tap into the brief cultures and religions that ironically have known this all along. And in, in realizing this, I'm like, holy right. cow. So I started doing the program and I started expanding my consciousness in various ways to better understand my, my soul and spirit and to communicate. What is the whole point of this? Well, this goes into where you're talking about the octopus and the tentacles, and this goes into where this absolute is connected to every single thing, creating all these different realities, creating our souls and, and, and many other entities and beings that exist in various forms, either dimensionally, interdimensionally, or with us on this planet that we don't see within our visual spectrum. So... When we start thinking about things that exist on this planet with us, outside our visual spectrum, because we only see about 10% of electromagnetic field, everything outside of that obviously is filled with various different waves, but there's the possibilities of other things that exist we can't see that are all around us. That goes into what I believe, obviously we call it supernatural, but also nature. So when you're talking about plants communicating, plants obviously in some shape or form have to be aware of these other entities, and that's where we get into elementals. But I know two years ago, in expanding my consciousness and becoming closer to nature, because I believe nature healed me, it started to heal me, because I started going for walks, mm -hmm. and I started experiencing this healing energy that was coming from certain forms of tree, just enough to, to make me feel a part of this world. And I remember walking into Manuel Antonio Forest, which is this natural forest, the ecosystem and its natural habitat where all these animals exist. It's not a zoo. It's just they're in their natural habitat. And I said to the universe, I want to come in contact with monkeys. And this voice says, I want you to touch the trees and the leaves as you walk into the forest. And I want you to send and broadcast that thought. So as I'm walking into the forest, I'm touching the leaves and the trees and I'm sending it through them, just like I would do when I'm meditating and trying to communicate with somebody on the other side or somebody that's within a home. About 15 yep. minutes, half hour later, 
we come up to, there's a couple monkeys way up in the trees. And I'm like, oh my God. So I'm looking at them and we see monkeys in the distance. And a voice says, remember those almonds we told you to grab last minute when you left the hotel? I said, oh my God, yeah, get them out. So I get them out. Next thing you know, I've got all these monkeys around me feeding off me. And the girl that I'm with, she's like, you know, you're not supposed to feed them and they're going to bite. I said, no, no, no. The universe has prepared this. I've already spoke to them. They know I'm not here to harm anything. I'm here to experience, become one with nature. And I'm feeding these monkeys. People come around taking pictures going, oh my God. And then the monkeys are coming up, hitting their chest saying, feed me, feed me, and communicating using sign language. Well, I've seen some National Geographic specials. (laughs) So here I am going, touching my chest, me, me. And they're like shaking their head going, no, 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 me, me, me. And I'm like, oh my God. So I'm like, okay, here you go. And... I have to tell you, it was the most remarkable experience I had on that trip, and it had to do with nature. And I I firmly believe that the trees somehow communicated through that whole ecosystem to bring that to me. It's interesting that you're talking about that because recently, uh, I've always, so one of the things that I'm not sure about my great grandmother's ghost, but ever since I've been a little kid, I talk to the wind. Uh, it's just something I've done. It's a, I don't even childhood form of spirituality, I guess, but I always admired the wind and talked to the wind and would joke with it. And, um, recently uh, I moved my parents in with me and I've been going back and forth up North to their house, which is in Northern Michigan, rural area, a lot of acreage and forest up there. And recently, I have found a lot of solace uh, talking to the trees. And if you allow yourself to experience the universe in its whole, and I say this to some people, and you won't find it strange, and I'm sure your listeners won't, but there's some people who will, uh, the trees talk back to you. Uh, Nature will respond if you engage with it. Uh, We are animals on this planet. We're part of the cosmos um, like you said, uh, the universe, uh, grabbed those almonds. We made you pick at the last minute. One of my mentors in later life was uh, a minister named Jack Boland. And he used to say that the universe is solving problems right now that you're not going to have for 25 years. Um, the problem is you, you'll have to catch up to it eventually. That's why you don't understand some of the things you're doing now. Uh, but he also implored people to spend time in nature and remember, uh, that, Brown is a great color, and as much as the blue sky, and so is gray, and and the red of leaves is beautiful, but also watching them turn into a, a moldy gray is beautiful as well, because it's the process of the universe, and you're it's a part so of nice it. It's so nice to hear someone state that and realize they're on that same path or that, that same perception, because one of the things I wanted to ask you that I said we would get to in, in one of the questions pertains to exactly that. And when you talk about spirits of the forest, uh, you know, spirits of the trees, is I was in, we were filming this past summer, I was in Devon in the UK, and then I was in the forest of Calverton in Nottingham. And I can talk about some of these things because some of these things aren't going to be in the show. But we came in contact with elementals. Now, I'd always heard of elementals, You know, growing up, I I remember going through the books when I was a little kid in the 70s and seeing the fairies and stuff. And unfortunately, those fairies with Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and stuff, those those girls had faked it. But I always wondered if those things were real because of some earlier experiences I had as a child that made me wonder, what are these voices and these spirits that are in the forest? It wasn't until this year that I actually got to see something that actually, I wasn't terrified. I was shocked because I had not seen something like this before. It goes into the gnomes, the pixies, uh, goblins type thing. Now, you have a book you wrote called Gnomes, Fairies, and Goblins. And I just actually ordered that on Amazon, so I should be getting it by tomorrow, Friday, because I look forward to reading that, because I need to expand my awareness and consciousness regarding this. I was going to say, one of the things, so that book, um, it, it has writings by me and Greg Newkirk and Dana Newkirk in it, but what it is is uh, they were on their own journey. And it seemed to be encompassing what people call goblins. And that was right around maybe a year after. So I was in the, uh, a gentleman called me up and asked me if I wanted to see an elf. And I'm always up for the strangeness of the universe. And so I went to 
his home uh, in the thumb area of Michigan after he had sent me a list of things to do um, and things like uh, talk to a non-human animal three times a day for three days. Uh, keep track of every left turn that you make throughout the day. And at the end of the day, make three right turns to negate the left turn for three days. Um, and so I did all this stuff that he asked me to do. And then I went up to his house in, again, rural Michigan. And we went out into a Michigan winter, about a foot of snow. And he would sing to them is what he told me. And he sang and I was standing there. And all of a sudden, uh, I noticed these kind of blue and and purplish fireflies. And I thought, oh, that's really weird. And <laughs> then I realized that it's January in Michigan and there's no fireflies. And my heart rate started to accelerate. And I had a camera around my neck. And I said, can I take a picture of the forest? It's dark. It was about 9, 30, 10 o'clock at night. And he said, yeah. So my camera flashed. And in front of me, standing on a little half log that had fallen down, uh, maybe 25 feet in front of me was a, a creature that was about 11 and a half inches tall, furry, uh, had a little face that looked like a cat. It was standing on its le hind legs, uh, had little arms. And as soon as my flash went off, it dove into the, the, the background of the dark forest. And I ran toward it and started looking for it. And uh, it was gone. But I saw an elf. Oh, my God, an elf, an elemental. John, that's, that's a credible story. Thank you for sharing that. See, that's, that's freaking awesome. And it's like you said earlier is, you know, whatever's fascinating you at that time is kind of what you're into. Mm -hmm. You've been meaning to tell me this because I am in the pursuit and awareness of understanding elementals based on, based on my experience. And I think that's incredible because this whole other world is beginning to open up to me. Mm -hmm. And by hearing you say this, it gives me more confidence for the experiences that I've had this year. I've got to, I've got to share this with you. We came in contact with elementals in various places in the UK this past summer. We captured their voices, the Pixies' voices on recording. We even have a gnome. He says, are there gnomes here? We have a gnome responding that we caught an EVP that is like unlike any other EVP we've ever had. And then I had this dream because when we were going to location to location, because we came in contact with these elementals in Devon, they were following us at other locations, and they were popping up. And even the ghosts on the recorder were saying, your friend is here, my friend is here, the pixie. I said, what? And they were saying, hi. And we were getting this on our ITC devices, and we're like, oh, my God. And then I had something jump in the window at one of the hotels. It raced around the room. I'm sitting there going, what the hell? And I'm thinking, is it a raccoon? Is it? I go, no, it's not. I, 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 it, it's not. And then it jumps back into the window. It's semi-transparent. You know, it's something that's maybe about two feet, three feet tall, and then it jumps out the window and it's gone. And, you know, I told my, my co-host, like, you're not going to be, are you sure was it? No, it was not a dream because I couldn't sleep all night. I was up all night and this thing happened. So I realized that there's a whole other realm that goes on in your, Europe to where they completely accept this. Here, yes, there's stories of, of the, what, the Pakwaji mm -hmm. and another type of little elemental beings, but there's such a rich history overseas. The interesting thing they talk about this is because when we were in Nottingham and Calverton, they said that people were afraid to go in the forest because of the, the tree spirits, spirits of the trees. And I'm hearing these names, nature spirits, tree spirits. And when I came home, I'm talking to my mom and she goes, oh yeah, I used to talk. And I tell him what happened. I go, mom, I saw an elemental and this. She goes, oh, I used to talk about the spirits in the trees all the time when you were a little kid. I go, what? She goes, Chris, the drawing I gave you when you were 40 years old, when you hit your 40 years old, my mom gave me this finger painting that I did in preschool. And I'm so glad she gave it to me because I completely forgot about it. Which I did this finger painting of our outside of our house with the trees, the squirrel on there and with our cat. And you said, see all the little circles with the smiley faces and the sad faces going around and flying around the trees. You said, those are all the nature spirits, the spirits in the wow. forest. They're not like the spirits that are in the house. They said they won't show themselves to you because I'll be afraid, but they also said that not to talk about the, the negative entities that are in the house because they don't like them either. Remember, my mom obviously giving me the drawing, and I actually have it hanging up in the meditation room, but then I realized, oh my God, I had experiences when I was a child with these nature spirits, but I never got to see exactly what they looked like because they knew I would be terrified. 
Well, you know, what's interesting is, so after I had the experience where I saw this thing that, that the gentleman calls an elf and I, I call it an elf because he does, um, I, I deep dived in it because it's such a strange experience for me to have. And it did, uh, follow me back to my home, wow. my property. But what was interesting to me was I realized that the list of things that he had given me to do. Uh, to prepare myself to be able to see this creature. I didn't realize it at the time. I realized it later that what he did was he had me become a child again. Mm. He had me talking to animals. He had me hugging trees, laying on the ground, digging my fingers into the soil. He had me, you know, the, the best way to do three times right for every one time left is to just count them during the day. And at the end of the day, I would spin around in a circle the way children do when they go outside to play. They just spin in circles. And when I ran forward that night, seeing that creature and I was searching around for it with my flashlight in the darkness and he was laughing and he said, you can't see it anymore. And I said, what do you mean? You can't, I can't see it anymore. And he said, you can't see it anymore because you are, are looking for it with a different part of your brain. And mm. at the, I didn't realize what he meant then, but what I realize now is that he took me back to a place of childlike wonder. That makes complete sense. And it has something to do with the visual spectrum, because I was reading on the Rescaterians, if, if I'm saying their name correctly, they're a society, a religious group, and they knew that these elementals existed, and they would communicate with them, and they'd discuss kind of their behaviors and their lifestyles. And in my uh, research for that, I found it fascinating that there's a lot that's known and a lot that's unknown about these different types of elementals. One of it is, is you have to be in a certain state of consciousness to be able to see them and experience them. And what I had done when we wrapped up our last episode, we were in uh, Cowerton Forest and we were having all these experiences with elementals, but we had these other things happen and that's part of the show, is I told the crew, I said, you know what, I want to sit here by myself in this forest. And it's like 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock at night and pitch black. And we're like a mile and a half out. I said, you guys just go, I'll catch up with you. I sat there and I said, okay, elementals, I know you're here. You know, and I just started opening myself up and I left my recorder going and I caught all these voices talking, whispering about me, whispering about us being there. They started talking about the gnomes. They don't like the gnomes. They started talking about the pixies. And one of them, I said, I said, I think some of you hate man because we're destroying nature. And then this really loud voice says, yes, you're guilty. He says, you're guilty. And then some of them said, why did you bring the demons here, the negative entities, the imps, and these, these other demonic creatures? They followed you in here. We don't want them here. They're following you because of some of the stuff you're doing. You know, I didn't know that until I listened to the audio later. But then right. I started feeling all these things around me, like these peering eyes. And I got to admit, I was getting a little uncomfortable um, because I know there was some that wanted me there and some that didn't. But I'll never forget, I said, you know, I had this feeling that they came from the fallen, that they were generations of, of creatures uh, from different species and stuff, whether it was the fallen or with the Elohim or whatever it was. And I said something at one of the locations that I'll pray for you. He says, no, you can't. We'll burn. And I'm like, well, why would they burn? You know, I don't quite understand that. But I, right. I said to him, I said, listen, I don't know if you go to heaven or not. I said, I don't know if you go to the other side, but I will pray for you. And then when my time comes... You're more than welcome into my heaven because I have this big, big tree there where all my pets are going to be, and it's going to be my place that I reflect on nature and all the animals that have existed on this planet. I said, you're more than welcome to come into my heaven, and I, and I will ask, give permission that you can. On the recorder, there's a voice that says, I will meet you at the big tree. Wow. And it sent, oh, I got chills right now. I had such chills down my spine when I heard that. And I was sharing it with, with Barry and Jane, my co-host. Obviously, none of this can go on the show because it's, it goes off on why we right. went out there. But for me, it was such an awakening that I, I really didn't have anybody to talk to. I'm trying to tell my mom, and she's just going back to preschool when I talked about the spirits and the trees. And not too many people know that Yes, there are ghosts and spirits that exist in the forests that are within the trees, but a lot of these other spirits within the trees are actually these elementals, these fairies, yeah. these goblins, these gnomes, and they exist. And the more you do research on them, you find more uh, stories and data and revelations that these things do exist. 
but my human mind has been struggling with this concept that they exist. So I just want to thank you for sharing that, your story about that, because I don't know too many people that have seen these things. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's strange because when it happened, I, I, my lectures are called weird lectures and I'll talk about anything weird, but even in front of a group of people, when it happened, um, the, the, next big conference I had at the time was at Michigan Paracon, which is a few thousand people. And so I got up on stage and I was like, am I, am I really going to talk about this in front of everybody that I just saw this creature? And uh, my parents were actually at that event. And my birthday is the weekend of that event. And my parents, for no apparent reason, because I hadn't told anybody this experience at the time, uh, for my birthday, my parents had gone to some giant super home and gardening store, and they had bought me like a four foot tall uh, garden gnome. Wow! And they they gave it to me like uh, ten minutes before I went on the lecture stage, and I was like, "Oh well, this is the nod from the universe that I'm supposed to talk about this." That is just incredible. You know, the Pixies stated they don't like the gnomes because you can't always trust them. <laughs> and <laughs> I. I, I I never know who to trust. (laughs) I know. You know, I I have to tell you, you know, it's hard enough growing up having experiences with ghosts, angels, demons, and seeing these things and being teased as a kid and, you know, going through college. And then even today, you know, having been in the mortgage business stuff, people look at me like, oh my God. But then some people, they understand it. I'm like, now, like my co-host said, he goes, you know, some people aren't going to believe us that we came in contact with these elementals at this home. Some people are just not going to believe what we witnessed. I said, I know it doesn't matter. We, we are investigators. We have to present what our findings are, regardless. Absolutely. And the other thing is, too, I, I speak to my friends and people at length about this. The, uh, you know, I, I have this idea that, you know, people always want to figure everything out. And all the cosmos has ever really shown to me personally is that it loves to create. It's a creator, right? And it loves to play. And whether or not anyone believes me or not uh, is at this point really not that important to me. Uh, My experiences are meant for me at some level and they're meant to be shared to some people and other people for sure. But the belief part of it, whether or not anyone has to believe it, uh, there was a time in my life where I, I needed people to believe the UFO that I saw or the ghost that I heard. But that went away once I realized you can have the best photograph, you can have the best recording, and there's still going to be people who don't believe you. Um, but the experience is meant for you. It's meant to make you think. It's meant to make you engage with the universe. It's meant to make you understand that you know what you think is weird is far weirder than you think. Exactly. You know, when, when they said in the recording, they says, we've always been here. It's just because you, you know, see us now doesn't mean that all of a sudden we exist. We've always been here. And it's just now you're paying attention to us. And they said something right. like, welcome to our world or whatever. The thing is, is they, because they said something like, he talks to spirits. Some of the people says, he talks to spirits and he talks to angels. And then they start bringing up some terms, you know, I wasn't familiar with, which my co-hosts were telling me, is when you get to this, like what happened with you, you felt the thing follow you. They become aware of you now and they all communicate throughout nature. Oh, yeah. So it doesn't matter where you go, they know of you now. And I always knew this in the spirit world with ghosts and spirits, they know of you. They become familiar with you. But it's the same thing with these elementals. <laughs> Word gets around. Yeah, it does. It really does. And I find that fascinating because one of them had said like welcome to our world now or welcome like they they gave this little gratitude like welcome, you know, because now we know what you do. We know you're not going to harm us. You have respect for animals. You have respect for nature. And once you get to that level of respect, it's like they kind of welcome you. Not all of them, but some right. of them welcome you because now they realize, well, you're no harm to us. And, you know, you would, you know, maybe we can break through to you or you can break through to us. I don't know. I don't know what it means yet. And that's a stage I'm at. So for everybody Mm -hmm. listening, and there's probably some people listening that have had experiences, some people that thought they had experiences, and some people in the future may have experiences. I wanted to ask you quickly about, you did the uh, documentary Hellier with Greg and some of the other people. Can you briefly tell us about that? Yeah, so uh, Hellier was this documentary that Greg, Dana Newkirk, uh, Carl, 
Pfeiffer and Connor Randall and Tyler Strand and some other people put together. Greg had gotten some emails a few years ago about a man who had goblins on his site. And they went to research the goblins and who the man was, and they ended up kind of falling down a, a rabbit hole of high strangeness, uh, leading them off in uh, mul a multiplicity of different directions. And so they've always kind of used me as a sounding board and maybe even a voice of reason sometimes when things get a little strange. And so they called me up late one night. I didn't even know that they were filming a documentary. And I, I answered the phone and that kind of surprised them. It was three in the morning. And I told them, uh, you know, the, the universe is strange. The universe is weird. It'll give you weirdness. Uh, but the majority of the advice that I could give them at the time, because they had you know, gone way off the, the, the rails. It wasn't just goblins. It was synchronistic events and, and weird timing of events and all these little messages from the universe that were coming through in ITC devices. And, uh, and I told them, I said, you know, the, one of the worst things that you can do to the universe is try and craft it into a narrative, uh, try to find an answer to it. When you challenge the universe like that, when you try to confine it, that's when you will lose your mind. You'll go crazy rolling around uh, looking for answers when the reality is it's not about answers. It's about knowing that this stuff happens, being satisfied with the fact that it happens and being self-assured, kind of what I was saying earlier, that your experience is real whether or not anyone believes It's fascinating. It. And yeah, we do try to pigeonhole you know i always thought these things in the trees were just ghosts you know i didn't realize because they never showed their true form and because they were talking to me oh they got to be spirits right. but there's something else and it's same thing with people sometimes they see a ghost and they think it's an angel or they think it's a demon or they think based on their limited belief system or their perception at that time yeah absolutely i, I tell people that all the time you know uh, we have difficulty enough as it is interacting with other human beings who are sitting right in front of us. Uh, you throw invisibility uh, and etherealness into the mix where you can't even see who you're talking to. And of course, there's going to be difficulty communicating. And so you've got to get past your own preconceived idea of what's happening. Uh, people often tell me, oh, there's a bad spirit or a bad ghost in that place. And they're, they're saying that not because there's a bad spirit or a bad ghost, but because they've encountered something that to them seems sad or angry and that doesn't mean that the spirit is bad. Right. Every, everyone that's listening to the show is, is somewhat fine in the security that they can get up and leave the room and go somewhere else and go talk to a friend. But if you were in your room by yourself for a year, 10 years or 50 years or 100 years by yourself with limited communication with anyone, uh, that might frustrate you and make you sad. It might make you angry, but it doesn't mean that you're, you're absolutely bad. right. It just could be a spirit in your perception is misunderstood. And once you know why it's upset, you're like, oh, wow, well, I get upset about that, too. Or I know people have been upset about that. So it's just that unknown of not being able to completely see it and understand why it does what it does that's scary. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's in Hellier, that was one of the things, too, is there were a lot of times when they were getting kind of creeped out and scared. And I, and I was telling them, you know, that's on you. Uh, you are ultimately in control of your destiny and, and your feelings, uh, so you need to wrangle that in sometimes. Right, yeah, and that's a great documentary, and I, I understand there's going to be a second one. Uh, there is a second one. I have I purposefully told them, because they were getting to some places that were pretty crazy, uh, I have been to that edge before where I've been so absorbed in my research, I kind of forget everything else, and I don't need to go back to that. So I told them, if they need me, I'm here for it. Um, but I'm super interested to see it because I have talked to them since they've been filming and stuff and just listening to the things that they talk about in their psychology. Uh, I can imagine it's going to be pretty crazy. Yeah, it sounds fascinating. I know everybody's been talking about it, and I thought it was really well done. I had told Carl about it, and I said, hey, great job. This was, this was great. What do you think now? There's a lot of shows on TV uh, and a lot of ghost hunting shows. When we're dealing with investigative series and documentaries that we've seen over the last 30, 40 years, we always go through these cycles, as you're well aware of. Right now, we're really heavy into ghost hunting shows. Where do you think we're going to go from here? What would you like to see from here? I think it's interesting because 
I think one of the aspects of kind of paranormal entertainment is that the television producers and the television networks don't really realize that they are working in an antiquated business model now. That television is really not how people consume information or entertainment anymore. It's it's done being done in a much different manner, whether it's on YouTube or TikTok or Twitter or Facebook, it's somewhere else. And so I think what you're going to see is a lot more content that's probably bought by the networks at some point for a format, but created by the actual experiencers of the phenomena. And that's going to be interesting because the networks and producers and all the people involved are going to have to get used to the fact that people enjoy and are intrigued with watching investigations and not so much with the scare factor that people love to see, uh, how an entire seance works, uh, you know, an extended people would watch an hour long program of just people doing a seance because they'd be fascinated with seeing it. Now, that's just something that I hear from people every single day. Why don't you, why don't they show that we've seen investigations done in a certain way, but now that we've been on ghost hunts or we've been at an event where there's a ghost hunt, we know that's not really how it works. We like to see how it actually works. And that's where I think television is going to go. It's going to start deep diving the ideas a lot more than just saying there's a spirit in this place. And you're going to see investigations become far more real and probably more intense. Well said. Well said. That's what we've tried to do with our show in the UK is get more into the psychological, not of the people, but also of the spirits of why they're there, but then have supporting evidence from them. You know, yeah. to verify that if we can, so once we get that, we can help them. We know we're on the right path. For and sure. I, that's the thing, a consciousness, more of the spiritual stuff, more of the understanding, not just, okay, there's a ghost here. We're going to do some sage and cleanse and get rid of it. Well, how do you know you got really got rid of it? And let's hear from the spirit. You know, can we find out what is going on in that spirit's world that has made it haunt that place? Yeah, absolutely. That's the nut we need to crack, I think. Yeah, it's interesting when I do, um, I'll do these events and we'll have those kind of big group ghost hunts. And it's always interesting to me when I go into a place and they say, um, oh, uh, a man died here. His name was Sam. He was 31. Uh, we're going to try and contact him. And so we'll do an EVP session or some type of ITC experiment. And the first questions out of people's mouths will be, uh, can you tell me your name? Uh, wh- how old were you when you died? And I always think to myself, well, if the, if the person that we were told about is who we're trying to contact, we already have all of that information. My first questions are always, can you tell me what you see? Can you tell me how you're hearing me right now? Uh, I'm trying to get information from the other side about what the other side is like, because that's what I'm interested well in. Well said, John. Yeah, let's see some uh, growth and, and expansion of new horizons in paranormal TV. Well, John, I want to thank you so much for being on this show. People can get a hold of you. They can go to your website, which is weirdlectures.com. Yep. And I've tried to make everything easy. Twitter is John E. L. Tenney. Facebook is John E. L. Tenney. Instagram is John E. L. Tenney. Or if you go to Google and you just type T-E-N-N-E-Y and weirdo after it, it'll lead you in a multitude of directions. <laughs> well, also, you've got a bunch of books out that you've co-wrote and you've written. Um, people can go to Amazon. They can check that out. You've got, what, one last thing? Ghosties, Haunts and Magic, Animal Ghosts, Skeptical Poltergeist, Sky People, Creatures and Spirits, Gnomes, Fairies and Goblins. Anything else you'd like to uh, talk about? Uh, I would tell people, you know, that's what's interesting to me. One of the the books, Ghosties, Haunts and Magic, is I went to the uh, Library of Congress and dug through the narratives of former American slaves. And it's t- tens of thousands of documents, but I pulled their ghost stories out and and some of their folklore and some of their magic. And uh, that's a really important book to me because we have a huge, huge supernatural and paranormal belief system that has been in America as long as America has been America. But we don't talk about it because it's uncomfortable because it has to do with slavery. And so not only are we having a deep discussion about slavery and racism, which we should have in this country, but we lose this very important spiritual aspect of ourselves because there's 
all of these stories and, and magic and and belief systems that we just don't explore because it seems uncomfortable to us. So that's the one I point people to. Well, I think it's totally comfortable. <laughs> 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 well, John, thank you so much for being on the show. I really appreciate it, and I wish you the best of luck. We'll talk about having you on again in the future, and I hope to see you soon. Great. Thanks for having me, Chris. It's been this fun. is Chris Fleming and my guest, John L. Tenney on Spirit Talk. Thanks for listening. If you like Spirit Talk, you can listen to past episodes on iTunes or planetparanormal.com. Over a hundred different archived episodes covering the paranormal and greater pursuits of consciousness. Also, please keep in mind, I have a website where I offer a variety of services, such as spiritual consultations over the phone or face-to-face. I also do angel cards and I can do a consultation session. But also I offer a Six Sense training course where I will work with you on your intuition, understanding the how, when, and why to improve and apply ESP while answering any questions you have towards your own psychic abilities. But then what about your path, your destiny? You feel lost, don't know what direction to go? Well, sign up for the Creating Your Definite Purpose course. We'll figure out your number one goal. We'll take a look at your current self and where you need to be to be your other self so that you can make these things happen. This one-on-one session is going to help you fulfill that desire. You'll write out a life plan, and I will show you how you can train yourself to put it to use. This can be done either face-to-face or on video Skype. Go to chris-fleming.genbook.com. Take a look at the services and book now. 